Welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for Harada House, a family story. Tonight's presentation is in partnership with the Harada House Foundation and the Museum of Riverside. My name is Katie Porter and I'm Executive Director of Inlandia Institute, a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in inland Southern California. Before we begin, Inlandia Institute respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kahuya, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So tonight I am here with Lauren Bricker of the Harada House Foundation, uh, who will tell you about their mission. And, and please note that if you have any questions uh, to please put them in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end of our presentation. So welcome Lauren. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Lauren Bricker and I'm the Harada House Foundation Vice President. For those of you unfamiliar with the foundation, our goal is to seek support, both financial and otherwise, so we may fulfill our purpose, which is to ensure the story of the Harada family struggle for civil rights and, and to make sure that that story is shared and remembered and learned from. The rehabilitation of the family house, a national historic landmark is key to our purpose. Tonight's program is important in connecting the dots between civil rights issues from the past and now. I hope you find tonight's program engaging and informative. If you are interested in donating, you can do so through our website, haradahousefoundation.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robin G. Peterson, the director of the Museum of Riverside. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I would also like to add my thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, on behalf of the Museum of Riverside, which is steward of Harada House. This is our second webinar focused on Harada House and offered in partnership with the Harada House Foundation and the Inlandia Institute. We're particularly grateful to Katie Porter, Executive Director of Inlandia, for so eagerly partnering with us. It's my pleasure now to introduce the star of the evening. Lisa Massingale joined the staff of the Museum of Riverside in 2018 as Curator of Historic Structures. With training and expertise in the archaeology of buildings, Lisa has the specialized expertise that will carry the museum through to the day when we can open Harada House to the public and tell its many stories in Robinson House, slated to be the interpretive center next door, in the very neighborhood where the Harada family's historic struggle began. Lisa. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with the Harada family story in the Harada house, um, I hope that tonight this gives you an opportunity to make a connection with the Haradas and their story. Um, from the very first time that I read about the house and the family, um, I made an emotional connection. You don't have to be a parent um, to empathize with what Ken and Jukichi went through and what the family has gone through. Um, Harada House, I must admit, is my favorite child um, of all of our historic sites at the Museum of Riverside. I mean, it is why I accepted the position here at the Museum of Riverside. Um, so it is always an honor to be able to share the house with others. So again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The 
Harada House was built around 1884 as a single story structure. It was built essentially as a small Victorian cottage. In 1990, it was listed as a National Historic Landmark, which is the highest designation available in the United States. It's within the city of Riverside's Heritage Square Historic District. Um, and it's also a city landmark and is in the process of being finalized as being a state of California landmark as well. The city has been the steward of the property since around 2003. Um, and you may have noticed that the house has uh, gained recent press in late 2020 for being awarded a Save America's Treasures Grant in the amount of $500,000, um, which we are currently fundraising the match for, um, as well as being named to the National Trust for Historic Preservation's 11 Most Endangered List for 2020. The house is located in downtown Riverside. It's an easy walk from the Mission Inn and the other sort of tourist and central core of downtown Riverside. It's a location that actually was one of the reasons why the Harada picked the house. The Harada's focused and picked the house. Um, it was in, within easy walking distance of their restaurant downtown, of the family's church, as well as the schools for the children. Um, I frequently get asked, is the community aware of the house? Is the neighborhood, is General Riverside aware that the house exists? Particularly since it's never actually been open as a museum. Um, and I'm happy to say yes, there's actually a tremendous amount of community interest in the house itself, um, particularly pre-pandemic. Um, I'm on site a lot working at the house and it never ceases to amaze me how many people come up. You can tell they're walking down the street, staring at maps on their phone, following the directions and their ultimate destination ends up being the Harada house. And frequently they'll have someone else with them. You can tell maybe they have out of town guests and they'll read on their phone about the house. Um, they'll read the plaques in front of the house. And it's often quite emotional. Um, it has been more than one occasion where someone will stand in front of the house, even just from the sidewalk um, and cry and get emotional about the Haradas and their story. So this is a house that even when closed, um, the story really transcends that. So Kenna and Jukichi Harada, they were both born in Japan in the late 19th century. Ken, she came from a family of samurai, while Jukichi was descended from a long line of school teachers. Their courtship and marriage was very unusual in that it wasn't an arranged marriage. And they married for love. They met through a Jukichi's friend who happened to be a Ken's older brother. And by age 16 for Ken and 22 for Jukichi, um, they were married and expecting their first child. Um, at this point, Jukichi was very early in his career as a school teacher. And according to his children, sort of the life that he could see before him um, with the small house and a modest school teacher salary wasn't really what he envisioned for himself and his family. Uh, he maybe wanted a little more adventure, a little more financial opportunity. So in 1898, he left uh, his pregnant wife, Ken, and he journeyed to the United States. Now, upon his arrival, it was the Spanish-American War. And so he signed up um, part of the crew for the USS Grant um, to support the US Navy in the Spanish-American War. And he served as part of the galley crew. Uh, he went on to serve other US ships as well. And then in late 1902, after having kind of a scary racist incident on board one of the ships he was on, he went back to Japan. Now, this is when he met his son Masuatsu for the very first time. Um, the portrait on the left was taken shortly after the family was reunited. I love this image. I mean, talk about a photo being able to tell a story. You have Jukichi, who at this point is wearing a Western suit. You have Ken and Masuatsu, who are dressed in traditional Japanese clothing except for the fact that Masuatsu is wearing a cap uh, that maybe his father brought back as a souvenir. And I can't help but notice the sort of subtle leaning of Masuatsu towards his mother. Um, at this point, 
uh, you can think about the fact that he didn't actually know his father. He had only just met him um, for the first time, so they weren't well acquainted yet. Uh, now, Jukichi in 1903, not long after this photo would have been taken, he went back to the United States. And in fact, he would never return to Japan again. Um, it, that was not the plan he intended to visit, uh, but it just never worked out for the family for him to return. So Ken and Masuatsu, they were supposed to follow and meet Jukichi, but Ken was pregnant again. And so they needed to wait until she gave birth. Um, unfortunately, their firstborn daughter died as an infant um, not long after birth. So in 1904, Ken and Masuatsu were able to make the ship's journey to California. Now at their port of entry, unfortunately, Ken was turned away. Uh, she had developed an eye infection um, while on the ship. And although there was nothing dangerous about it, immigration authorities would not let her enter the US. But Masuatsu was healthy, and so they let him into the country. Um, and the family decided that it was indeed best for him to stay with his father in California, and Ken would try this process all over again. So in 1905, Ken journeyed back to the United States, but this time the family was advised it would be best if she went through Canada. So she took a ship to Canada where Masuatsu and her husband, Jukichi, met her and then they traveled as a family down to California into the Inland Empire. And they initially settled in Redlands uh, and then soon after moved to Riverside uh, where they would stay and make their home. Uh, initially, they worked in other people's restaurants. They worked in the Golden State restaurant that was owned by another prominent Japanese American family. Uh, but around 1910, the Haradas took over the ownership and management of their own restaurant. And that was the Washington restaurant in downtown Riverside. The restaurant had been open for approximately a year or so. It was already named after George Washington, but Jukichi really embraced the presidential theme. Um, he decorated the interior with portraits of other US presidents um, and he, George Washington adorned the menus um, and he really leaned in um, to that patriotic American theme. Now this photo was taken in 1912 in front of the restaurant and it shows Jukichi with two of his children. Um, one year after this photo was taken, California passed the Alien Land Law of 1913. Now what that meant for the Harada family was that they could no longer, it was completely illegal for them to purchase or hold property in California because that law stated that anyone who was ineligible to become a US citizen could not hold property in the state of California. Ken, Jukichi, and Masuatsu as well, they were all born in Japan and would not be allowed by law to become US citizens until the 1950s. Um, so this meant ownership of any property um, was completely out of the question in the state of California. Now, in the meantime, they celebrated the birth of Tadao in 1907. Tadao was the first US born son of a family. So in other words, the first son who was a US citizen. That was a big deal especially for Jukichi. Um, by all accounts, he was very close with Tadao. Tadao was the apple of his daddy's eye. Um, and in this photo, I love the fact that little Tadao, he's wearing a sailor suit, um, maybe a nod to his father's naval service uh, to the US in the war. Um, but they were very close. Unfortunately, in 1913, a tremendous tragedy struck the family. The family was living in one of their rooming houses. At this point, they were making a, a modest profit um, by renting properties and then renting them out as boarding houses. That's also where they lived. Um, Tadao contracted diphtheria. Uh, and one night in 1913, um, he died in Jukichi's arms in the middle of the night. Obviously the loss of a child is always devastating, 
but this particular loss was very, very hard on the Herodic. It was life-changing. Uh, it's when they converted to Christianity and Ken and Jukichi were very devout Christians for the rest of their lives. But it's also what set Jukichi on this path where he was convinced that the way to keep his children and his family happy and healthy and safe was that they need a single family home. They could not continue living in a boarding house or a rooming house. They needed a home of their own with a yard with fresh air where it wasn't crowded, you know, hostel like uh, conditions or hotel like conditions. And um, now, while Jukichi was determined to create this better life for his family and was working on the financial means to make that happen, in 1914, they lost another child. Ken had given birth to a daughter and uh, infant Yone, she died as well um, at a very young age as a baby. Um, so by 1914, they had already lost two daughters and a son. Now, in 1915, Jukichi and the family, they were ready to find a house to purchase. And in December of 1915, Jukichi saw this ad for a house on Lemon Street. Um, now this house, it's what we would consider a flip today. Uh, it was for sale by the Gunnarsons via attorney and real estate agent, Mr. Noble. Uh, the Gunnarsons had recently acquired this house at a cost of $1,150 uh, and they repapered it. So add a new wallpaper, they repainted and then they put it on the market for $1,600. Uh, Jukichi contacted Mr. Noble and expressed interest in purchasing the house. He knew Mr. Noble, he trusted him um, and trusted that this was a good deal. Uh, but of course, Mr. Noble, he had concerns because Ken and Jukichi legally could not purchase property. So how were they going to buy a house? And Jukichi assured Mr. Noble, it was not a problem. They had a plan because three of their children were US citizens. So little Mine, of age nine, Sumi, who was about to turn six, and Yoshizo, who was all of three years old, um, they would buy the house and own the house, um, funded, of course, by their parents. Mr. Noble was not entirely sure if that was legal and above board, so he wrote the California Attorney General, and the Attorney General assured them that yes, indeed, um, that was legal, Legally, they were US citizens, and so the law did not prevent them from holding real estate in California. Uh, now, Mr. Noble still had to convince his clients, the Gunnarsons, however, to sell to a Japanese American family. Um, they were not thrilled at that prospect, um, but for a price of $1,500, which was a tidy profit for them, they agreed that they would sell the house to the Haradas. That was not, however, the end of the drama surrounding the acquisition of the house because the neighbors were not thrilled at the prospect of the Haradas moving in. Um, so the neighbors got together and they formed a citizens or a neighborhood committee. And their goal was to stop the Haradas from moving into the neighborhood. Um, they assured the Haradas that they were not racist, but rather they were merely concerned that the Haradas moving into the neighborhood would depreciate their property values. Um, but they claimed that that was not racist. It was just a financial matter. They tried to convince the Haradas, since there wasn't a legal way to stop them from moving in, they offered them extra money. So the Haradas had just paid $1,500 for the house. So they offered them $1,800. Then they raised their offer to $2,000. So, you know, a nice profit of $500, they figured the Haradas could go buy a nice house in some other neighborhood. Uh, Jukichi's response was quite emphatic, as you can see from the screen, um, his very famous quote in response to the offer of $2,000 um, was, I won't sell, you can murder me, you can throw me into the sea, and I won't sell. 
So clearly Jukichi had a plan for providing that happy, healthy, safe environment for his children uh, and no one was going to stop him, um, least of all the unhappy neighbors. Ken, she was not so thrilled at this prospect. Um, she told the neighbors that she didn't wanna go where she wasn't wanted, uh, but her husband in this instance had made the decision uh, that they were not going anywhere. Now, believe it or not, this was major news, this acquisition of the house. Two local papers ran the story on Christmas Day in 1915, um, talking about how rich Japanese restaurant owners were purchasing property in California in their children's names. Um, of course, the Radas were a very modest means, um, but that didn't stop the papers from misreporting the facts. Um, and by January 5th of 1916, the LA Examiner paper had picked up the story as well. Um, so this is a clip from that LA Examiner article. And you can see it shows the three children who technically purchased the house. Um, and that's probably the only image we have of what the house looked like prior to its renovation. Um, so this is the house as it looked as a Victorian cottage when the Haradas first purchased it in December of 1915. Um, despite all this hullabaloo, despite all this bad press and the neighborhood being very upset, Jukichi, he was determined this was, this was his family's home. And so he actually hired a contractor shortly after this article uh, made the papers. Uh, he hired a contractor to add a second story to the house um, as well as to repair the foundation. Um, I find the foundation repair be quite ironic. Um, I'll talk later about our great foundation problems. Um, one of our greatest causes of instability in the house structurally is the bad foundation. Um, so as you can imagine, it has not improved over the last 105, 106 years uh, since the Haradas bought it and noted that it had a bad foundation. Ken, meanwhile, during all of this whole process, she's pregnant again. And in 1916, she gives birth to son Clark. Now, despite the reassurance by the California Attorney General in writing that nothing about this was illegal, the Citizens Committee had such clout politically that they convinced the California Attorney General to let them file a lawsuit, a criminal lawsuit against Jukichi and his children for the purchase of the home. And they alleged that they had illegally circumvented that alien land law of 1913 and that Jukichi and Ken had to still have um, sort of interest in the house. So it was, it was illegal because they still, whether it was in their name or not, clearly they had an interest in the house um, and it, they owned it whether their names were on the deed or not. At least that's what they were claiming. Um, this lawsuit made international news. Um, it was filed about 10 months after they bought the house. Um, and the press even spread rumors saying that the Japanese government would declare war on the United States if the verdict was unfavorable for the Harada family. Um, so this is an enormous news story that happens. By 1916, this story is just blowing up. It is international news story. Ken at home, she's very scared for her children. Um, they're living in the house at this point and she made her children promise and taught them they could never accept food from anyone. Um, if they couldn't politely decline, they could take it, but then they had to throw it away. They could never eat anything that was given to them by someone else. And it was because she was terrified that someone was going to poison her children. Um, I'm not a parent, but I cannot imagine being a mother, being terrified that your own neighbors might murder your children simply because you and your husband were born in Japan. Um, you know, this is a really scary situation for the family to be in. So the court case lasted from 1916 to 1918. And as you can see, it was officially fi uh, filed against Jukichi 
and Mine and Sumi and little Yoshizo um, as the defendants. Jukichi testified as did six of the neighborhood committee members. Um, much of the testimony centered on why Jukichi purchased the house, why he wanted the house. Um, why did he want the house for his children? Um, and he testified that he bought it as a Christmas present for his children. And even the committee members that were testifying for the prosecution also said and reiterated that Jukichi was very clear at the boarding house, the rooming house, the family had been living in was not healthy and safe for the children and that he explicitly said he was buying this house for his children so that they would be healthy and safe and have fresh air and have a yard. Um, and this was really pivotal to what ended up being the ruling in favor of the Haradas. So in September of 1918, uh, Judge Hugh Craig of Riverside Superior Court ruled in favor of the Harada family, saying that the children were US citizens and therefore they had the same rights as US citizens. Didn't matter that they came from a humble background or who their parents were or how old they were. They were nonetheless US citizens. So the Haradas, they were able to keep their home. So they went on to have a two more sons, Harold, was actually born in the house in the downstairs bedroom in 1923 and then in 1928 they adopted their son Roy and now on this screen um only Roy is still alive today he's 101 uh, going on 102 years old um, and as you can see they lost um three of their ten children. Um, only seven children actually survived to adulthood out of their original ten children. Now the family, um, they continued to flourish. They did very well. Uh, Masuatsu, the eldest son, in this photo he is pictured in the middle back holding his little son Calvin. Um, Masuatsu, he became a surgeon and he his nickname was Doc. And um, you had uh, Mine, uh, she's on the far left. She got married um, and had children. Uh, Yoshizo, he is on the bottom left sitting down. Um, he became a dentist, a clerk who's standing up on the far right. He became a speech pathologist. Um, and Harold, he later followed in his brother's footsteps. He's the little boy on his daddy's lap. Uh, and he also became a dentist. Now, at this point, when I'm talking with people about the story in person, um, you know, everyone breathes this incredible sigh of relief when the when you find out that they won their court case and the family is able to keep their home. And you have a sense that for once history got it right, that, you know, civil rights, social justice, it prevailed. They got it right um, in this case. And then there tends to be this pause. And then the sort of look of horror and this realization and the question is asked, what about World War II? You know, and people always say, please tell me the family is okay in World War II. I mean, of course, it's not okay for Japanese Americans in the United States during World War II. Um, you have, after Pearl Harbor, you have Executive Order 9066 that happens, you have very invasive searches that happened. The Harada home was searched while Ken and Jukichi were home. It was searched by FBI agents that tore the place apart and did seize what they considered to be contraband um, or possible evidence of loyalty to the Emperor of Japan. Um, and you have the family preparing for forced removal. Um, so at this point, uh, the, the restaurant, which was was being run largely by Sumi at this point um, because Ken and Jukichi were not in good health. Um, Sumi has to sell the family's restaurant and at a tremendous loss. Um, she just has to liquidate it as quickly as possible. Ken and Jukichi, they're in such poor health, the children do not want to have to remove them. Um, they tried everything. They even spoke to the Riverside Chief of Police who was a dear family friend. Um, no one could find a solution. And so Ken and Jukichi, in their failing health, along with the rest of the family,
they do undergo forced removal. And we know that Harold and Sumi left the house, their home on Lemon Street, at 7 a.m. on May 23rd of 1942. And that was a Saturday. And we know that precisely because Harold wrote it on the wall of Clark's upstairs bedroom. Um, it was also noted on the calendar downstairs in the house. Now the family, because at this point they were living in different areas, they were split up and sent to different concentration camps. So some of the family ended up at Tule Lake in California. Some ended up in Poston in Arizona and some eventually ended up at, at Topaz in Utah. Now, meanwhile, and um, while the family is being sent to the US concentration camps, dear family friend, Jess Stubler, moves into their home on Lemon Street. Um, Jess Stubler, he was a bachelor, a dear friend of the Haradas. He ate his meals at the Washington restaurant. Ken used to pack his lunch for him um, when he went to work. And he moves into the house and he takes over all of the Harada's affairs. And the Harada has had income properties. He collected the rents on those. And all of their insurance policies were canceled because no one would insure a Japanese American family. Um, so Jess, he's able to obtain insurance for the properties. Um, he pays the bills, he pays the taxes. Um, he sends all of the receipts and notes to Sumi um, well, when she's in camp, so she can be kept updated all of the financial affairs. Um, he also updates her on what life is like in wartime Riverside, what's happening at the house. He tries to keep up her morale and tries to cheer her up. Um, and he also sends supplies as well as treats. Um, so when they needed things in the camps, he would mail them to them. He even took a road trip to Poston with dozens of donuts. Um, the Harada kids later said they don't know how he convinced, one, they don't know how he found his way to post him, and two, how he convinced the guards to let him in, but he delivered dozens and dozens of donuts to them in the U.S. concentration camp at one point. Um, so he was trying his best um, to be their friend and to help um, with whatever they needed um, during their wartime. Um, now, Sumi, Harad, and Roy, they were split up from their parents and Masuatsu, and they were very well aware that their parents were in very poor health um, and deteriorating rapidly. Ken, in particular, her health had been worse to begin with, but in the camp hospital, she continued to decline. Um, so Sumi, Harold, and Roy, they were able to obtain a transfer to Topaz um, in 1943. They went straight to the hospital upon their arrival to see their mother, Ken. A few hours after they saw her, uh, she had another massive stroke um, and the next morning she died. And this letter is one of the letters that Jess Sebler wrote shortly after Ken's death. And it is one of the letters that makes me cry every time I read it. Um, in this letter, he asked Sumi, where was your mother buried and was there a headstone put up so that you can find the grave? Um, I think that's a really sobering look into life in a U.S. concentration camp. When your friends ask you and are worried, like, do you even have a place to mark where your mother is buried? You know, like, are you going to be able to find your mom's burial place ever again? Um, that's it's just really, really horrible. Um, and then Jukichi, he dies the following year. Um, I will say on one note of this, Ken and Jukichi were actually both cremated and Sumi hand carried their remains with her wherever she went. Um, and then eventually post-war when it was safe to do so and they were allowed to do so, um, the children did reunite in Riverside at Olivewood Cemetery where they buried their parents next to to Dao and Yone, um, their children who had died previously. Now, the Harada sons, they served the US military during World War II and after World War II. Masu Atsu, the eldest son, he 
begged the U.S. government to let him serve in the military, but they would not allow it because he was born in Japan. Um, Yoshizo, who was born a U.S. citizen, he had to also beg, but he was granted permission. So Yoshizo served in the U.S. military um, during World War II, as did Harold and Roy. And Clark joined the military um, in 1946, right at the end of the war. Um, I'm happy to report that all of the Harada sons returned safely from World War II and from their military service. Now, Sumi, in 1944, she was allowed, she was released from the US concentration camp at Topaz, um, but she was not allowed to return home. Japanese Americans were not allowed to go back to the West Coast. So she moved to Chicago, which at that time was deemed to be an appropriate quote unquote relocation location. Um, and then in 1945, in summer, she's able to move back home to Riverside where Jess Stebler is waiting at the house for her return so she can move back in. Now, um, one of the local um, ministers, he was aware that Sumi was returning home to this you know, quite large house and that the rest of her family wasn't going to be coming with her at that time. It was pretty much gonna be Sumi living in the house by herself. Um, so he asked if she would open up her house as a rooming house or, or boarding house for other Japanese Americans who had no place to go, who they had lost their homes um, as a result of their forced removal and incarceration. Um, and could they stay with her, you know, for a few months um, each while they, you know, got jobs, they found places to live, et cetera. Um, so Sumi agreed. Um, and we do have physical evidence of this time period in the house. Um, in the downstairs bathrooms, there's still the fragments of a note um, where Sumi instructed her guests, her boarders, um, which towels were clean and where to put their dirty towels. Um, this is also the point where the upstairs sleeping porch, which was a screened in porch, um, was actually walled in um, to create extra space um, for more people staying at the house. So Sumi, she never married and Sumi kept everything. Um, I say with great love, um, Sumi was a hoarder. Um, that's actually not uncommon in, car in incarcerates after World War II. And it's a known phenomenon that Japanese Americans and other people who were sent to the US concentration camps um, did tend to have hoarding tendencies after the war. Um, you can imagine if everything you had was taken from you, um, you don't wanna give up anything after the fact. Um, and there's been the, the term coined the privilege of clutter. Um, for sort of this phenomenon after the war. So Sumi truly kept everything. And I mean, everything was in the house when the museum acquired the property in 2003. Now the museum though had to quickly pack things up um, because it became apparent that the house was not structurally stable. It wasn't structurally sound. Um, so the museum kept everything. Everything was boxed up and labeled exactly as to where it came from. Um, and then emergency stabilization has happened in the house basically ever since its acquisition for the last 17 years or so. Um, so you can see in the photograph um, on the top left, um, there's a lot of plywood sheathing inside the house um, and there's bracing on the interior and the exterior. So this is stabilizing the house itself structurally. And it's also stabilizing the historic finishes. Um, we have amazing historic plaster and historic wallpaper, um, but they are detaching <laughs> uh, from the, so the lathe and plaster, they're separating, they're delaminating, they're coming off. Um, so some of the, the plywood is holding that on until we can deal with that. And then all of this bracing is helping keeping the house upright um, particularly since we're in an area that's prone to earthquakes, 
we have had some amazing seismic events since I moved here a little over two years ago. Um, and this all just helps temporarily keep the house together until we can get to the proper rehabilitation stages. Um, and just one of the reasons um, why I mentioned earlier that the house is so unstable is that foundation, um, which is just really terrible. It's also because of termite damage. Um, this house is racked with unbelievable termite damage. Um, we have structural beams that now are very lightweight. You can just easily pick them up. And if you shake them, they sound like a rain stick. That's because all that's left inside of this structural support beam um, is termite frass. So that refers to termite excrement. Um, and it's like little tiny pellets that so looks like sawdust. And basically that's all that's left inside of these beams in many instances in this house. Now the big materials conservation project um, that we've undertaken since I started here um, is the historic siding for the house. Um, so the siding, it's considered a character defining feature. Um, the wood siding on this house, it's iconic in how the house looks from the street. So because this is a national historic landmark, it's very important for us to preserve how that looks, as well as whenever possible, the original historic material itself. There's, there's it's never as good of a substitute as the original. You wanna keep the original when you can. Um, so prior to me getting here, our structural engineer asked for some of the siding, just some bits of siding to be removed so they could see just how bad that termite damage was to the structure. Um, they realized they needed to take all of the siding off. Um, you can imagine this is, you know, 1800 something square foot house, two stories. There's a lot of siding. It all carefully came off. Every single piece was labeled. Um, you can see an example of one of those tags on the left there. Whether it was a tiny fragment that broke off that was maybe two inches wide or a 20 foot long board, um, they all came off the house label. And they were all stored in the Robinson house, uh, which is the house directly next door um, to Harada. And I'll talk more about it later. Um, so when I got here, um, I needed to prepare this um, for more long-term storage in proper archival collection storage, museum storage, so that eventually these pieces of siding, they can be conserved, they can be preserved and prepared to go back on the house once it's fully rehabilitated. Um, so that meant not only cleaning everything because of course it's been outside, it's really dirty, um, but using foam to carefully wrap every piece of siding, um, creating an inventory, tying everything up with um, this cotton ribbon we call twill tape, and then making custom made baggies for them. So if you ever bought pop tarts or crackers or anything like that, and it comes in those vacuum sealed silver foil bags. Um, that's basically what we created just on a much larger scale. Um, the material we used, it's food grade, it's used in the food industry, but it's also safe for museum artifacts. It's, it's archival grade as well. So we bought these giant rolls of, it's called Marvel Seal, but it's um, big silver, looks like aluminum foil. And we created custom bags for every piece of siding. Um, it took a while, <laughs> especially a little challenging when you have boards that are over 20 feet long, um, but we did it and everything is in collection storage offsite, waiting for the day when it can go back on the house in its rightful place. Um, now people wonder why I get excited talking about siding. Um, yes, I'm a historic building person, so I get very geeky about anything with historic structures. But if you look on the top right photo, that's why I get excited about things like siding. That's a piece of siding that has clearly had another life. It has floral wallpaper on the siding. So this wasn't just exterior siding. Um, it had clearly been on the interior as well. And I, we actually found multiple layers of wallpaper in some of the siding. So that's the kind of stuff where you get really excited. You can see old layers of paint and old paint colors. Um, and that's when the house starts revealing these little quirky surprises that you never expected to find. Now monitoring 
I always say is one of the key things when you are being a steward of a historic site. It's critically important. Um, so this photo I took standing on the Harada porch um, a couple of months ago and during a windstorm. So that is the neighbor's jacaranda tree that fell. Um, thankfully, it missed everyone's house. It missed the power lines, did not miss the neighbor's car, uh, but no one was injured. And we just had another windstorm a couple of days ago. Thankfully, no trees were lost this time at the house. Um, we also worry about, we are always you know, monitoring uh, for rainstorms. Um, so if you look on the photo on the right, those dark spots on the floor, that is where water was coming in from a new roof leak. Um, so every time it rains, I'm at the house doing a full inspection as well. Um, we developed new roof leaks in March of 2020. Um, I'll talk about more as to why that happened in a moment. Um, but right now the house is actually all professionally tarped on the roof. And that is um, holding it pretty well. We just did a drone inspection and checked on the tarping and it looks good. Um, so we have a big rainstorm apparently rolling in on Saturday and the next week. So I'll be over again, checking in the house. Um, but I'm pretty optimistic that we'll do all right with these new storms. On the left, that's a photograph of one of the floors in the upstairs um, bedroom. And those little bits on the floor, that is plaster. Um, so I mentioned the plywood uh, sheathing, helping to protect wallpaper and plaster finishes. Um, I am constantly monitoring for plaster loss, um, especially after earthquakes or after other seismic events. Um, if there's any road or construction work with vibration in the area, I'm always checking for that as well. Um, generally, if it's a piece smaller than the size of an iPhone, it's not too concerning. Um, anything larger than that, I don't like to see. Um, it's also really a great clue to us to detect early leaks in the house where water is getting in. Um, frequently long before you'll ever see an actual drip, um, you'll start losing plaster in that area. Um, so it's always a red flag uh, that we need to do some further investigation in the house. So pest management is critical. I mentioned that the house is structurally unstable due to termite damage. Um, termites do not rest, they continue to this day. Um, so this photograph of tenting was in March of 2020. Um, about a year ago, I started noticing new uh, piles of what looked like sawdust, so frass, um, the excrement of wood boring critters, um, and new holes in the plywood sheathing that's inside the house. Um, it turns out we had wood boring beetles. So all of that plywood sheathing, that's or at least some of the plywood sheathing inside the house, um, when it was brought in several years ago, we didn't know at the time, but it was actually infested with woodborne beetles. Um, it took a number of years of them munching away on the plywood in the house before we could see them. Um, but we did eventually see them. And so we did have the house specially treated and tented uh, for woodborne beetles last March, um, which also killed any termites that were hanging out in the house as well. Fortunately, as you can see someone standing on the roof, that's how we sustained new roof damage and roof leaks. Uh, the week after this tenting, it poured torrential rain. And if you stand on the Harada roof, no matter how careful you are, every step you take, the roof crunches underneath your foot. Um, but now it's all professionally tarped um, and knock on wood so far, it's holding up. So of course, the long-term plan here though, is to open the house as a museum. Um, and you know we're still in discussions about exactly what that will look like and feel like, but the idea is that this will be a house where you will feel it is very much the Harada's home that you are stepping into. Um, it, you will be in the Harada home. And um, now I mentioned before, Sumi kept everything. And when the museum acquired the house, the museum kept everything. Um, so that means now I'm having this super fun adventure 
of going through all of those boxes and seeing what do we have. Um, it means finding things like 1990s dirty takeout styrofoam containers and used toothpicks, not so exciting, um, to incredible treasures like the antique Christmas ornaments and Christmas decorations from the family, and which when you see them, you can just imagine the Harada children and their parents decorating their Christmas tree in the house. You found the, the collars and the tags and the licenses from their pets. Um, so when the Haradas moved in, they had a cat and a dog. And then when Sumi lived in the house by herself and, you know, sort of the 40s onwards, she had dogs. So we found Tootsie's collar and Tootsie's tags. Um, all these things that really, you know, you just make a connection with them. You say, oh, yes, they're, you know, they're like, I have a little dog and she had a little dog. And you just start thinking about how they lived in the house um, and connecting with them even more. Um, so it's really fun for me to go through and start imagining what are the artifacts that we can put back in the house once it's a museum to help tell this story? Um, and also going through the archives and finding photos that we don't know we have. Um, it's very, very exciting. Um, and lots of possibilities for future interpretation. So we do have an interim interpretive plan. And um, as you can imagine, um, the pandemic has, has put a kibosh a number of our plans since our interpretive plan was developed in the summer of 2019. Um, but we did revive our Instagram. So if you're not following us at Museum of Riverside, um, please follow us and like our posts. Um, I run our Instagram and I do it very heavily towards Harada House. We do feature other properties and museum sites as well and collections. Um, but you, since I'm doing a lot of the content creation, you'll see a, a definite slant. Um, towards Harada House content. Um, there was a, there's an existing um, previous grant funded tour um, that you can get a copy of from the museum and that features various Japanese American sites around Riverside. Um, for 2021, we're developing, we hope, two short films. Um, the first will be a short tour of the house. And then the second um, will hopefully be focused on Ken Harada, more sort of her perspective um, on those events from 1915 to 1918. And we are working on community exhibitions as well, including an exhibition to go in the historic courthouse where the trial took place. It's the courthouse is still here in downtown Riverside. Um, and hopefully once um, things are a little bit better in the pandemic, we'll be able to install an exhibit about the trial and the court case in the place where it actually happened. We are incredibly fortunate to have amazing partners and stakeholders. Of course, the Harada House Foundation, uh, who's co-sponsoring the webinar tonight. We also have the Harada House Project Team, which includes internal and external stakeholders um, who help provide guidance on the Harada House. And then I am incredibly honored to say that we have members of the Harada family um, actively involved. Um, Naomi Harada is in the photo on the left. She's on the far right. She's sort of our, our family main contact, um, very actively involved with the foundation and the museum. Um, it is truly a rare gift as a museum curator to have family members involved when you are working on developing a museum and interpretation about their own family. You know, usually you don't have you don't have heirs, you don't have family members that are directly involved. So this is incredibly special to me personally uh, and professionally um, and to the museum as well. And speaking of Naomi Harada, um, she would like to share something with you. Hi, I'm Naomi Harada. I'm the granddaughter of Jukichi and Ken Harada. My father, Harold, was born in the house on Lemon Street on the first floor. What would be the one thing about the Harada house or the family that I'd like to share? Gambate. This is a Japanese word nuanced by feelings of empathy and encouragement. 
roughly meaning to persevere. You can do this. My family's story is not unique. We share similar events and circumstances as anyone else. Despite challenges, if you gambate, success follows and others may benefit from your perseverance. My hope for the house is for it to serve as a symbol for civil rights. I would like it to be a place for education. My grandfather was trained to be a teacher and that would fulfill that legacy. I'd like it to be a location for people to gather, to be able to understand each other, a place to discuss, formulate, and implement strategies so that barriers could be dissolved, barriers to housing, education, access to economic opportunities, and equal rights. So many thanks to Naomi Harada for sharing with us, which leads us into the incredible excitement of phase one. Um, you know, after years of sort of just keeping the house um, in this sort of emergency uh, stasis um, and emergency stabilization, thanks to that Save America's Treasures grant and the $500,000 that we are actively fundraising to match it, we are actually going to be able to proceed with phase one of the rehabilitation. This is a huge, huge, exciting deal for the house and the family story and the museum. Um, so people often ask, well, ask, well, what is phase one? The foundation. Um, it's a more complicated than that, but it really focuses on the foundation and creating a sound literal and metaphorical foundation for the house for the rest of rehabilitation. And we can't do really anything else to the house until it is structurally stable and replacing this foundation is integral to that. Um, phase one includes our stabilization work as well, um, some stabilization of materials in preparation for leveling the house and building this new foundation. Um, but it's really all about making this house structurally sound so everything else can follow. Um, you can't do all the pretty things, uh, it's sort of the more fun things until you have a house um, that is stable and safe for people to be in. Um, so it is incredibly exciting that we're working on getting that RFP out very soon. Um, so that will be going out soon. And of course, actively fundraising that match, um, which is of course just only one part of the long-term phased plan to eventually be able to open this house as the museum. So next door, it's been mentioned sort of in passing a couple of times, the Robinson House. So the Robinson House is directly to the left of the Harada House, if you were standing looking at the Harada front door. It's where Mrs. Robinson uh, lived when the Haradas moved in. She was actually the troublemaker that started the whole Neighborhood Citizens Committee who was opposed to the Haradas moving in. Ironically, she actually became very close friends with the Haradas and particularly Ken once they moved in. Um, but initially she was not a fan of a Japanese American family coming in. The museum acquired this house in 2014 explicitly so it could become the interpretive center for the Harada house. Um, that plan right now is for the Robinson house to be reconstructed so that it will appear as it did around 1930. Um, right now, Mrs. Robinson probably wouldn't recognize her house and neither would the Haradas. It's undergone a lot of um, unsympathetic renovations in recent decades. Um, we have photos and documentation of what Robinson House looked like around 1930. Thanks to the Harada's family photos, they took out in front of the Harada House with Robinson House in the background. So that's our best documentation. So uh, hopefully soon we will undergo and start that reconstruction effort. Um, and then this will be an amazing modern interpretive center for the house. So next door, you'll be transferred back in time in the Harada house. I'm probably feeling like the Harada family lives there um, and you're stepping into their home. And then Robinson will be where so the modern technology, the modern um, museum interpretation happens, as well as having additional 
um, interpretive and meeting um, community spaces. So just a reminder, there is another webinar on the Harada House next week on the 26th um, as part of the 11 most endangered um, status of the house from last year, the National Trust has partnered with the California Preservation Foundation to put on webinars about each property in California that was listed. And so Mark Rowich, who literally wrote the book on the Harada House, he wrote The House on Lemon Street, he will be co-presenting with our museum director, Robin Peterson. Um, so you can visit our Facebook page for a link to register for that. Um, or you can also just go to californiapreservation.org and sign up directly um, for that webinar. So I, Naomi Harada has some parting words for you. On behalf of my family, I'd like to thank you so very much for joining us and for your interest in the Harada House and its story. Thank you and take care. So many thanks to Naomi Harada and many thanks to everyone who has joined us this evening. Again, it is an absolute honor to be able to share the Harada family story um, with you. Um, and you are always welcome to contact myself or Robin or the Harada House Foundation. Um, if you have questions, if you have comments, suggestions, um, if you'd like to know more about donations, um, please feel free to contact us. And from here, we will start addressing your questions. And we do have a few questions. Thank you all again, everybody, for participating, for comments and questions. The first question we have um, is this, is there a record of the neighbors who objected to the Haradas living there? A petition with names, for instance. And this audience member is wondering, if the former owners of her home, which must be in the neighborhood, were among those who wanted them to move. We do. We have an exact list of everyone who was involved in that committee and their addresses. Um, and so we know exactly who they are. Most of them, as I mentioned, also testified at the trial. Um, and ironically, some of them were actually not born in the US. Some of them were Canadian and German. Um, but still apparently that was that was very different uh, than being Japanese American. Um, so I do have a list of um, them. So if you um, are interested in a particular address um, or a particular person, um, probably the easiest way is to um, email me and I can answer your question if you live in one of their houses. Um, but it includes um, the Vandegrifts, it included the FARs, the Hanslers, the Fletchers, and the Fritz families. And then Mr. George, whose last name I slaughter every time. Thank you. Um, another question uh, comes from actually from a member of our Harada House Project team. He's asking, are all the historic images, newspaper articles, and so forth that you showed from the Harada family or from other sources or both? They are I think, I think probably entirely from our collection. Um, I would have to double check on that, but the majority of the images that I used, um, with the exception of maybe I think uh, the one about executive order 9066, I think that might be the only one that's not from our collection, but I think virtually everything else is actually something we have in the Harada family's archival collection. And another question specifically about the family, this uh, audience member would like to know more about the conversion to Christianity and how that happened, how it manifested in their family decisions and choices. So yeah, it's very interesting. I don't know as much as I would like to about that. It's discussed in some of the children when they did their oral histories with Mark Rowich. Um, but the children talked about how when Tadao died, and that was so devastating, especially for Jukichi, the person who came to the family, who came to Jukichi and Ken, was the local reverend. Um, and he seemed to understand and really connect with Jukichi and Ken um, in a way that no one else could. I don't know if the reverend had lost 
lost children previously. I don't know how he was able to do that, but he was sort of emotionally and spiritually able to connect with them, support them the way none of their other friends or community members could. And so as a result of that, they became very devout Christians. Um, they went to the Methodist church in Riverside. Um, and as, as quoted by one of their children, they were die in the wool Christians from literally that day forward. And um, I don't know how much it influenced the way they lived the rest of their lives. Um, Jukichi's children very much talked about the fact that Jukichi taught them, their father taught them um, to not just be respectful, but to be, um, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but he had this ethos of almost sort of like turn the other cheek is sort of how the children described it. Um, and that his way of being and accepting things that were unjust and illegal that happened to the family, he felt like they should not um, react too harshly to that. That they, you know, sort of that turn the other cheek mentality, as I said. There's a question about the house itself. Um, this audience member says, it breaks my heart to think that the house could fall down and the story lost forever if the city doesn't prioritize its preservation or if the funds aren't raised to keep the house together. Besides helping to raise funds, what can the community do to help promote your purpose? And I can start the answer to this by simply mentioning spreading the word about the need and the campaign and uh, being engaged in um, some of the social justice and anti-racist uh, programming that we're increasingly trying to put out through the museum and through our related partner sources. And Lisa, if you've got anything you'd like to add to that? I got just, you know, things as simple as following us on social media, um, believe it or not, do help. Okay. We have um, another question is, are there security cameras in place on both houses, meaning Harada and Robinson, and are there problems with vandalism? Do you want me to answer that one or do you want to answer that one, Robin? Yeah, we, yeah go ahead. Um, so we can't get into the details of our security protocols for any of our properties, um, but we do have full security measures in place at all of our sites um, and they are all monitored um, with professional monitoring services. I just can't say what those services are. So the next question is uh, one I've had myself actually, how did the Haradas afford their multiple passages across the Pacific? It's a very good question. There's, I have a, there's been a lot of questions generally with how did they afford any of the things that they managed to fund? Um, and in the oral histories, the children say that their parents were just really, really good at saving money and scrimping and finding a way to pay for things. Um, that they really saved uh, to make things happen. And um, what was the address of the restaurant? There's more than one, wasn't there? There's, there was a series of restaurants. So um, sort of the, the address that is the most sort of famous location, it is still standing and it's 3643 University Avenue. Um, but the restaurant did move around a lot. Uh, do any of the Haradas still live locally? And where is the site of, okay, you just mentioned where the site of the former restaurant is. They are not local. That's right. So um, one more question. If, the, if they had to sell the restaurant, and this would have been, you know, 42, how were they able to retain rental properties? And um, maybe I didn't uh, know that myself, were they able to retain rental properties? So the difference is the properties they retained, they owned the land, they owned the property, the restaurants they leased. So anything that basically they leased, they lost is my understanding. Whereas the properties that they actually owned, just Stebler was able to manage for them. Um, you also have to keep in mind a restaurant has to have people running it and it was a family operation. So with the family gone, there was literally no way to keep that running um, 
th there was just there was no one left to cook and open the restaurant and run it because it was all family staffed really at that point. So this audience member is asking about the possibility of a virtual tour of the house. And um, I can certainly answer that. We're, we're working on um, a couple of versions of such a thing, a short version, so you can get a quick fly through and see its current condition and a more detailed one that would take you from the attic to the cellar. So yes, the answer to that is Stay tuned, they're on the way. Um, and uh, this individual missed the first part of the presentation and is asking when the museum will be open, a question I wish I could answer. And she's especially interested in the stuff as her father was an internee and they have no documents of his childhood. She'd like to learn something about life for Japanese Americans back then. So there might be something in the planned uh, interpretive, the interpretive plan that we have, the interim interpretive plan that will give more access to the collection itself. Yes, and of course, long-term, you know, ideally the collections will be digitized and available online as part of the museum's sort of long-term goals. So um, this individual asked, didn't Sumi attend the first congregational church, which is the one right next door here to the, the main downtown museum site? He's saying he used to give her a ride home. Yeah, they, uh, they attended a couple different churches um, over the years. Are there any members of the Stebler family still around? So, Apparently, yes, I haven't, um, I haven't connected with them, but we've seen some comments on social media from, um, from nieces and nephews. He didn't have any children. He was a bachelor, um, but there are um, nieces and nephews out there, which I do want to connect with. So Robinson, this question about how Robinson House was purchased, it was um, purchased as a result of a private uh, fundraiser fundraising campaign um, that the museum's um, previous director, Sarah Mundy, ran in 2014. So it is was entirely uh, purchased by donation. Uh, this audience member just says she's just looked up the a restaurant address and see that it's the current Dragon Marsh on the mall. And asking if this establishment is aware the, of the history of their building. And I believe they are. Yes, they are, yes. So another question about Jess Stebler, what happened to him after Sumi returned? How did he become friends with the Harada family in the first place? You know, I don't know how they became friends. I can surmise it was through the restaurant because he was one of their best customers for years. He ate, I think, all of his meals there, um, sort of being a typical, I guess, bachelor at the time. Um, that was where he got all of his meals. Um, I don't know for sure how they met, but he and Jukichi were very close um, and he was close with the whole family. Um, he actually didn't live a lot longer after World War II. Um, he, was only, he only lived for a few more years. So I see an interesting little note from Mark Rawich, the author of The House on Lemon Street. He says that Harold told me the family received about $150 for the fixtures of the restaurant as the total of the sale, which um, was more significant some then than it is now, but certainly was not much. No, definitely it was a loss. Mm -hmm. So another question about how much property in aggregate did the family have? I'm, I'm assuming that this would have been with reference to the time right before the incarceration. I have not put a list together yet. I'm still finding, <laughs> evidence of all the of the various uh, addresses and properties they have and that's actually on my to-do list is to start recording um everything we have tax receipts for etc and make sure we have an actual um comprehensive picture of exactly what they owned when so in process i did find by accident the fact that uh, in the late 30s the restaurant owner ownership was actually transferred to sumi um, which i hadn't known previously um, are you able to answer this question? How large was the Japanese population in Riverside in the 1910s? Ooh, I don't recall off the top of my head. The, um, 
Japanese American context statement that was prepared um, under the auspices of the National Park Service should have that information. I think it is in there. They discussed that history, yes. And that is, if you just Google um, Riverside Japanese American context statement, um, you can find that PDF online for free. Okay. And one final question, where can the book, The House on Lemon Street, be purchased locally? And we do know that the Riverside Museum Associates has it available. And um, there are, it can still be acquired through the, it's not out of print. It can be acquired probably by special order for any bookstore. And that, oh, here's one more. Did Mine become an artist? Oh, uh, Mine Harada? Yeah. No. I think this audience member may be thinking about Mine Okubo. Yes, yes. Who was a dear family friend, um, a family friend, but uh, but different, different person. Also from Riverside who went to school with, uh, and was friends with Sumi and wrote Sumi for many decades after the war. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the questions that were submitted. And thank you to all audience members for your interest. Um, oh, here's another comment that the book has been at the Mission and Museum store, but not sure if it's still available, but it's not difficult to acquire. And I will um, just offer a final thanks to everybody for participation. Um, we do have a little bit of information for you, some contacts for supporting the campaign. And I know Katie is working on getting those slides up. The Harada House Foundation, uh, haradahousefoundation.org is one way to do it. Um, the Riverside Museum Associates also has a restricted Harada fund and the city can directly receive support restricted for Harada House. And when we report on the progress of our campaign, which is an ambitious six and a half million dollar goal, we report on all those sources um, aggregated together. We, we need about another 100,000 to make sure that we, have, we can achieve the match for the Save America's Treasures grant. You can get involved with any of the other organizations in the in, Inland Empire, including in Inlandia, um, which focus on telling the stories of this area, its diversity, and its, um, its path toward greater inclusivity. And with that, I will pass it back to Katie with, uh, and again, final thanks for all of us. So thank you all. Um, thank you, especially to Lisa and to Robin. Um, I learned so much tonight. Uh, I've known about the Harada House for a long time, but I've never known the story of the family and how um, it became this iconic landmark that it is. So uh, we are glad that you could join us this evening. And on behalf of Inlandia Institute, we thank you all for being here. And if you um, want further information, you're welcome to send me an email as well. And I can put you in touch with uh, anyone else in um, the Harada House Foundation or the Museum of Riverside. So with that, uh, I would like to just wish you all a good night and thank you uh, again, and we will see each other again soon. Thank you.